Dying Christ destroyed our death. Rising Christ restores our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, James Thomas Broy he'll put on Christ. So in Christ, may Jim be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he appears that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. My friends, we have gathered here this morning to praise God, to witness to our faith, and to celebrate the life of Jim Broyhill. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. As a testament to our faith, let us stand and sing hymn number 369. <laughs> Let us pray. Eternal and loving God, we come to you in a spirit of faith, hope, and love as we have gathered family, loved ones, friends to remember and celebrate the life of James Thomas Broyhill. 
We give thanks for his life, his faith, his love, his gifts, and his grace. Be with all who mourn and help us to place our trust in you. For you are our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. We bless you for the fond memories and for our deep conviction that life is Lord of death. We bless you for the blessed assurance that love can never lose its own. We offer praise and thanksgiving for the love and the loyalty Jim gave to his family, for his leadership that he gave to government here in the state of North Carolina, in Washington, D.C., and around the country, and for the positive impact he made at both home and abroad. We pray for the healing of the nations for a world that is redeemed from war and hatred, all that kills abundant living, let it from the earth be banned. In our quest for common justice, let us hallow life's brief span. Now, dear God, lead us through our years and bring us at last into the company of the redeemed, all who stand before thy throne. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Psalms, number 121. I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. A reading from John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Romans 8, 28, 8, 8, 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God.
James and I are going to share with you one of our grandfather's favorite poems, and it is called The Train of Life. At birth, we board the train of life. And it's that, at that time that we met our parents. And we believe that they will always travel at our side. However, at some station, our parents will step down from the train, leaving us on this journey alone. As time goes by, other people will board the train, and they will be a significant part of our lives. Our siblings, our friends, our children, and even the love of your life. Many will step down from the train and leave a permanent vacuum in your life. Others will go so unnoticed that we don't realize they are gone until we notice their seat is vacant. This train ride will be full of joy. It will be full of sorrow, fantasy, expectations, full of hellos, goodbyes, and farewells. A successful journey consists of having a good relationship with all passengers, requiring that we give the best of ourselves. The mystery that prevails is that we do not know at which station we ourselves will step down. Thus, we must try to travel along the track of life in the best possible way, loving, forgiving, giving, and sharing. When the time comes for us to step down, and leave our seat empty, we should leave behind beautiful memories of those who continue to travel on the train of life. Let's remember to thank our Creator for giving us life to participate in this journey. I close by thanking you for being the passengers on my train. It is quite intimidating to be tasked with public speaking in remembrance of one of the best public speakers I have ever known. Really, it's odd to be the one up here in front of you when, in my mind, it should be Papa himself. There is hardly a family event that I can recall where he wasn't the master of ceremonies or otherwise holding court, telling stories, or giving a speech. So, yes, Papa's passing leaves a noticeable absence for us, his grandchildren. And yet we know how lucky we were to have had him in our lives for so long. The six of us have spent the last week exchanging between us our memories of Papa and his role as a grandfather, which has been a process both sad and heartwarming. I will do my best to share some of these memories and Penn will follow with some more. One thing, we all unanimously agreed upon. Boy, did he love ice cream. Elizabeth recalled a time when he was staying at their home growing up when they were awoken late at night to the exterior alarm going off. It turned out Papa had snuck out to find the extra freezer out back and was caught red-handed with his spoon midway to his mouth from the tub of ice cream. Ashley remembers his picking her up from school once a week and always stopping for a detour on the way home to Baskin Robbins, but only so long as she promised not to tell Lulu. This was, after all, against his doctor's orders for whatever health-conscious meal plan he was supposed to be following at the time. Whether it was these illicit ice cream trips or treating me to a gourmet meal of fried chicken and strawberry shortcake at the K&W cafeteria, Papa would never miss ordering dessert. 
This will always win you big points with grandchildren, or later on, with great-grandchildren, who are particularly fond of the rainbow sherbet at Arbor Acres. He was always the first in line at the ice cream station at Sunday brunch. Penn remembers his claiming that blueberry cobbler was an acceptable side dish, and not long ago, I witnessed him eating pumpkin pie at Arbor Acres, thinking it should count as a vegetable serving. We all remember his delight in taking us on train rides at Tweetsie Railroad over the years and treating us to golf cart rides up at Elk River or in Florida. Lindsay remembers that sometimes he would let one of us drive before quickly exclaiming that he was so scared he had turned white and then pulled down his sock to show off his golfer's tan. In later years, he took us on rides in his minivan. He really did love a quality minivan. Unsurprisingly, as a career politician, Papa had a healthy sense of self-confidence. And he didn't hold back when letting us kids or others know how to do things the right way, which was his way, of course. He taught me how to make a proper handshake, which was a useful skill I've no doubt used throughout my life. Arguably less helpful was when he would critique my piano performances growing up, suggesting different improvements he would have made playing the piece, never mind that he did not play the piano himself. Ashley remembers his coming back from playing golf with friends and expressing in frustration, well, I would have had a better time if they would have just played the game right. But no matter these helpful and less helpful critiques, when it came to his grandchildren, we always knew he was proud of us. He bragged about us constantly to one another, showing off our accomplishments, like one of our new business cards or photos of our children, his great-grandchildren. Side note, he was convinced every great-grandchild took after him or his family in looks. He has my father's eyes, was said by Papa, I think about at least the majority of our kids. The Broyhill genes are strong. I'm pretty sure the most proud of me he ever was was my starring role as Annie in a community theater production at age 11. He would introduce me to his friends well into my 30s as Laura, she was Annie, remember? In all seriousness, during one of our last conversations, he told me how proud he was of the job I was doing as a mother to my children, a compliment that meant the world to me. He adored spending time with his great-grandchildren. What a gift that they were able to know Papa. I think for all of us, Papa's love of Lulu and their over seven decades of marriage was a real model for us as we go through our own lives and marriages. Their love story, particularly their early years, dating and courting, almost obtained a mythological status, and he loved to tell us the story of how they met. In my mind, they were true couple goals. In my dating years, if I got serious enough with someone, the true test would be taking him to meet Lulu and Papa and seeing if he passed muster with them. My poor husband, a native Philadelphian, remembers visiting them for the first time and having Papa loudly whisper to Lulu, what did he just say? I can't understand his Yankee accent. We still aren't sure whether or not he was joking. Papa was absolutely devoted to Lulu, and though she would say she was worried he was so handsome he would get snatched up by some enterprising widow at Arbor Acres, we knew he only had eyes for Lulu. On their 71st anniversary in June, he emailed the six of us a picture of her with the caption, there must be an error. Someone who looks as young as this cannot have been married for 71 years. Papa had so much love for Lulu, for his children, for his grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so many others. I know we all felt that love for him, too. I hope he is looking down on me now and approves of this speech. I'm sure he would have suggestions for how he would have done it better, of course. And I hope that he is enjoying unlimited ice cream up in heaven. As Laura mentioned, Papa's devotion to the loves of his life, Louise Broyhill, my grandmother, and ice cream, which really were the hallmarks of this man. But understanding this mountain of a man included a few other trademark characteristics in many, many stories that we did have the pleasure of sharing this last week. Papa was one of four siblings. He had two sisters and a brother, and he loved them all. He was lucky to grow old with two of them. And we would always remark how the three of them almost had a way to be playful and friendly well into their 90s. He loved them so much and would talk about them. We all could see his love for Aline 
and how she was like a ray of sunshine to him. She was truly one of the kindest people ever. But he also had a deep love for his brother, Paul, who, for those who knew him, were almost exact opposites of people. And that brings me to one of the major characteristics of my grandfather. He was, I think you could call him, you know, let's say frugal. He was a frugal man. We heard about his minivans, but we also loved talking about stories about how his brother Paul would tease him by charging BLTs and other small purchases to his bill at a country club, knowing that my grandfather would go line by line and remember that that $2 charge was not his and get flustered. Now, Papa would always get him back, too. My sister Elizabeth shared with us how once they were up in the mountains going to eat together. And as they see that they looked over and they saw his brother Paul, who was a few tables over eating with people. Papa got a grin on his face, and Elizabeth knew he was up to something. Now, as I said, these were definitely people who were opposites of each other, but still loved each other. Paul was somebody who you could say was a wine connoisseur. He loved wine. My grandfather whispered to the waitress and had a smirk on his face. Finally, Elizabeth said, Papa, what is going on here? And he said, look, 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 and had his classic trademark giggle. All of a sudden, the waitress walked over to Paul's table with what was Papa's favorite wine, which I'm sure was cheaper than the dinner rolls that were free on that table, <laughs> and had probably been bottled in the last three weeks. And he got excited and got a roar of laughter as they presented it to his brother, who would never be drinking that. And finally, they pointed out who sent that bottle. So he roared in laughter and waved at him. That's the thing about Papa's. He was a playful man. My siblings and I talked about stories of how when we went to fancy restaurants as kids, to try to get us to be quiet and behave, he would tie up linen napkins and make them look like a bunny rabbit. He would remind us, hey, you need to be quiet, the rabbit's sleeping. And he would hold it in the crook of his arm. If we started getting a little too loud or fidgety, all of a sudden he'd pop his arm in the air and he would go up. He'd say, you scared the rabbit, you woke him up. Sometimes I think he did it just to make us laugh even more instead of being quiet. He loved having fun with us and he loved sharing his pastimes with us. One of those that I'm sure many of you all in here experienced with him was the game of golf. He loved the game of golf, and he loved even more passing it on to his grandchildren. James and I talked about how he loved seeing how we progressed in our golf games. He was someone who would be willing to give advice, tell us how to hit that ball further, even though we could hit it further than him. But he also was proud of us. James talked about how he would call friends over to the driving range and point out how far his grandson was hitting the ball now. He was so proud of how he could hit that golf ball. Now, even his frugality showed up on the golf course, but somehow it was endearing. See, my grandfather, Papa, was a clever person, and he was used to rallying people to causes. And the cause he had on a golf course was finding a free golf ball. He went so far as to bring me and the other grandkids in on this endeavor. I remember nights after the golf course had closed at Elk River, he would have us walk along number 16. And we would sit there and walk along the river. And if he saw a golf ball, he would convince me as a grandchild to take off my shoes and wade out into that river. You see, he realized something. Golf clubs and ball retrievers were no match for a grandchild who wanted to see their grandfather be happy. And if anyone ever had that pleasure of riding in his golf cart, you'd see dozens and dozens of noodles, Wilsons, and other golf balls that had long since been discontinued riding along so that this man never paid one dollar for a golf ball. <laughs> As we got older, we started moving on from collecting golf balls with him, but still wanted that ability to connect with them. He was someone who was invigorating and exciting to talk to. He might dominate a conversation, but he had a story and a joke for everything. He had an encyclopedic memory. 
He could name all the kings and queens of England from William the Conqueror to now. He could walk through the vice presidents forwards and backwards. And he always wanted to share knowledge with all of us. And that much included what was the final Jeopardy question the night before. Because you better believe he did not miss Jeopardy. It went so far as Lindsay shared with us that she had a friend who was a physical therapist helping Papa. And one day he was working harder than before. And she was wondering, well, you know, what's into him? All of a sudden he mentioned, well, Jeopardy's coming on soon, so I need to get through with this workout. He never missed a day. I'm going to miss all those talks that I had with him. We were all lucky to spend so much time with him. This fall is going to be especially hard as the Carolina Panthers play because I'm not going to have my buddy to call after the games where we talk about the highs and mostly lows of the Carolina Panthers. But Papa had nearly a century on this earth with a fulfilling career, a marriage to the love of his life, and treasured friendships that meant the world to him. This frugal, loving, ambitious, playful, and powerful presence will live on with us in these memories and stories that my, my siblings, my cousins, and I will be happy to tell. Thank you all. Well, I am so proud of my children being able to get up here. It seems like I don't have much more to say. I was worried as a son to get up here and talk about a father at a moment like this. Uh, I always knew from everything we know about families how hard that is to a son to get up and speak about his father. One thing that uh, he told me is I don't want people there to be sad and miss me in such a way and he wanted humor and uh, he was uh, he was so thrilled to, uh, he would be so thrilled to hear some of the comments that have been made by the children today I'm so proud of you thank you so much many of you uh, probably know him well every day of his life was scripted he always had a lesson uh, to teach and so my relationship with my dad from the day I was born was a daily lesson of some sort. It was hard to even play golf without him giving me instruction about how to improve my game. But uh, before his passing, uh, he was preparing for this moment, and I was with Mike Brown, who uh, was with me by his side. And uh, he wanted to make it clear to me that when I stand up here and make presentation for him, there were only two things that I needed to do. And one was to welcome you all here and thank all the folks that have been a part of his life and in this service itself, and to keep it short. So I'm going to try my best to do that and live up to his expectations. There's uh, one fo uh, funny and humorous moment was when Mike Brown was praying and we were preparing for some words that uh, he may want uh, uh, at this service. Uh, one of the things he spoke laying from his bed and looking up with a smile at Mike Brown, he said, I've already all written it down for you, Mike. <laughs> and so it'll provide you your script. Uh, so that gave us a big laugh for that moment. I just want to welcome you all here uh, to uh, provide a final blessing for my father. Uh, each and every one of you, many have come far away from California, from Florida, uh, I have had 
Marilyn and I and Mother have had just an unbelievable outpouring of uh, support and compl complimentary messages, hundreds if not thousands of emails. And uh, I woke up this morning and I was uh, so proud of the fact that Governor Cooper has lowered the flags in the state to half mast, which I am so appreciative of and is a great honor for him. Of course, many of the folks that have served with him and who have pursued elective office are here. He would be very proud of your service. Each one of you have played a role in his life. Uh, at the age of 95, he felt like a uh, more than just a great grandfather to you all in your service, but many who have uh, taken their time to come, many of I thought were in the Middle East, like Senator Tillis, Senator Budd, Richard, of course, who is uh, going to be up here on stage to provide some memories, and Lieutenant Governor Robinson. I want to thank you all for all the efforts uh, that you've made to be here today, and of course, our good friend Dale Falwell. As you know, I've been trained in politics, and I felt like this was a moment maybe as a fundraiser with the folks that are here. <laughs> that would probably have made him very proud. Uh, I just want to, uh, there's so many other precious friends and family members, of course, here. And on behalf of my mother and my sister and I, we want to just say a very, very big thank you. We have uh, this evening or this, after, uh, this morning, uh, you'll be hearing uh, from some of the folks that have been very, very precious to him throughout his life. And they'll be speaking from their heart and bringing back memories of uh, of experiences they've had and how he might have had an impact on their lives. Uh, I asked Dad once what his greatest, uh, at least legislative, uh, achievement was in life. Uh, and I was curious about that and wondering what that might have been, what he considered his uh, most memorable uh, achievement in Washington. And he said, to me that the greatest achievement was establishing the Overmountain uh, Victory Historic Trail, which represents uh, the many colonists, the colonial uh, arm, uh, volunteers who came out of the mountains to defeat Cornwallis's uh, army at Kings Mountain and Camden, and that led to Guilford House, battled ultimately to the uh, uh, retreat of Cornwallis to Yorktown, where he was, uh, where he surrendered. And uh, the Overmountain Victory Trail, for your all's information, is going to be described in more detail. Uh, but Dad played the legislative role in getting that passage of that becoming a federal trail, I think one of only five in the country. And he told me the reason why that was the most valuable legislative achievement was that it represented North Carolina's role in the establishment of our country and our uh, preserving of freedoms and liberty that we enjoy today. And he can't think of anything more uh, representative of his heart and his, and his many efforts as a public servant representing them. Uh, today, his uh, burial will be at Little Rock Baptist Church, which is in Boomer, where my grandfather uh, was born and lived throughout his childhood. In fact, the church there was built by my great-grandfather and uh, his sons, and they operated a sawmill there, so the original lumber that was there was actually something they had built of hand. And uh, that is only about three miles, I think, from the uh, Overland Victory Trail, which now runs from Abington through Elkin and all up in the Tennessee mountains. And those, uh, uh, so it'd be certainly uh, appropriate that uh, he will be a part of that trail and be uh, remembered for that. And, and today, we, of course, have the honor guard of the Overland, uh, Over Mountain Victory Trail here, both here and also at the burial, so that you uh, can best understand how <coughs> proud he was of the, his affiliation with that organization and, and how blessed he was that you welcomed him as you have over these many, many years. With that in mind, I just want to say, in behalf of my father, how thankful he has been for each one of you and his life and how important you all have been. And uh, on behalf of the Broy Hill family, we just want to say thank you very, very much.
In the time allotted to me, I'd like first to thank the Broyhill family for the honor of speaking, you, speaking to you today about my dear friend. And I want to focus very briefly on three of his many beautiful attributes, his integrity, his intellect, and his sense of humor. He once told me about the first speech he made when he decided many, many years ago to run for Congress. After the speech was over, his campaign manager had the temerity to say to him, you know, I've heard a lot of bad speeches in my life, but I think that was about the worst I've ever heard. <laughs> of course, he worked hard on his speech, and as all of you know, he became a very fine public speaker and a man who had a funny story for every speech and for every occasion. His integrity you are also familiar with. What you may not be so familiar with was what a very keen intellect and knowledge he had. He knew so much about our history about our Constitution and about the convoluted and somewhat strange procedures by which the Congress does its business. He was a true scholar of history and government. Before the hook comes for me, I want to say I think he's in heaven now, and I want to express my everlasting gratitude for his service to our country and our state, and for being my friend. Thank you. Senator Broadhill's impact on our state and government was profound. But on the lighter side, he really loved being a Romeo. We of us who were retired old men eating out loved to listen to his jokes, and we admired him for his recall of historical events. He could recall all the presidents and vice presidents. He. Uh, and Louise often listened to Jeopardy at night. And he often was good at, at responding and answering some of the more difficult questions. And he would come to us the next day and say, Louise was really proud of me. <laughs> God bless, we love you both dearly. Hill family, friends, and admirers of the Senator. I met Senator Broyhill only 20 years ago when I was asked to interview him for a history about the founding of the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, the trail being an accomplishment which greatly pleased the Senator, an important part of his legacy of public service. During the following years, 
the Senator and I were involved in other subsequent projects for this trail, his trail, if I may. And I observed then how much the Senator loves America, loves North Carolina, and loves his family. And the Senator was kind to write the forewords for my two books about the Battle of Kings Mountain and the Over Mountain Victory National Historic Trail. In those forewords, the Senator wrote of his lifelong affection for the story of the Battle of Kings Mountain, that ferocious confrontation on October 7, 1780, that turned the tide of the American Revolution. He wrote of growing up in a home where he heard stories about that patriot victory, of knowing in the community descendants of the heroes of that battle, and noting with pride that Fort Defiance, the home of one of those heroes, William Lenore, was in his home county, Caldwell. But his personal interest in the story of that battle and the trail went deeper still, the senator said, because as he wrote, in 1975, a remarkable group of dedicated citizens came to me as a member of Congress and asked me to help secure federal recognition of the route these patriots followed out of the mountains to confront the invading British forces. After three years, the bill he sponsored was signed into law by President Jimmy Carter in the fall of 1980, just weeks before the, 20th, the 200th anniversary of that battle. That new legislation made the Over Mountain Victory Trail the first national historic trail east of the Mississippi River. Now in 2014, the citizen support group the Over Mountain Victory Trail Association conducted the 40th consecutive annual reenactment march of the historic trail as they have continued to do since 1975. During that two week reenactment, my friend here with his twin militiaman statuette went along. They travel the entire length of the 330 mile trail in Virginia Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina, day by historic day, having their pictures made at each historic site and memorial. That twin brother-in-arms statuette stands proudly today in the Kings Mountain Room at the History Museum of Burke County in Morganton a gift to the museum in 2020 as a tribute to Senator Broyhill on the 40th anniversary of the trail's designation by Congress. That statuette is there because Morganton is the heart of the trail, the home to Quaker Meadows where thousands, a thousand men on horseback and foot gathered after crossing the snow-covered Appalachian Mountains in a four-day march from the over-mountain regions of North Carolina and Virginia. They were joined by 350 militiamen coming up the Yadkin River Valley. The leaders gathered under the Council Oak and made plans to pursue the arrogant British Major Patrick Ferguson, who threatened, if you do not desist your opposition to the British arms, I shall march this army over the mountains, hang your leaders, and lay waste your country with fire and sword. These men, serving in the organized state militia of North Carolina and Virginia, were joined by men serving in the state militias of South Carolina and Georgia. Together, they relentlessly pursued Major Ferguson until 3 o'clock on the afternoon of Saturday, October 7, when they bravely charged up the sides of Little Kings Mountain three times in the face of cold steel, having pledged to each other as Americans, we will not fail. They defeated the Loyalist troops atop Kings Mountain that day, 
securing a victory which Thomas Jefferson later called that joyful annunciation of the turn of the tide of success which terminated the Revolutionary War with the seal of our independence. Now, I heard Senator Broyhill tell that story many times over the years to different groups, and in every talk, he was certain to declare in his conclusion, if there had been no battle of King's Mountain, there would have been no battle of Cowpens. If there had been no Cowpens, there would have been no battle of Guilford Courthouse. And if there had been no Guilford Courthouse, there would have been no Yorktown. Imagine that. No surrender by the British at Yorktown, no history of American independence, no U.S. Constitution, no Bill of Rights, none of the American liberties we enjoy today. None of that had there been no Battle of King's Mountain. That is what Senator Broyhill wanted and wants every American to know. And what those of us who also love this story and love this trail believe and hold in our hearts and what we want everyone to appreciate is that there would be no over mountain victory national historic trail if there had been no James T. Broyhill. We thank you, sir, and we salute you. Mrs. Broyhill, you look as beautiful today as you did 60 years ago when I met you for the first time. Bob and Marilyn, Ed and Melanie, six, six I want to say great grandchildren. I meant your grandchildren who are great, but that would be confusing. And 13 great grandchildren other family members and friends. Over the years when I've had the opportunity to introduce uh, Senator James Thomas Broyhill, I asked friends what adjectives should I use to describe him. You've already heard many of those words today. Honest, ethical, sincere, intelligent, loyal, hardworking, dedicated, compassionate, and many more. While Senator Broyhill was widely praised for his constituent service, and rightly so, he compiled a legislative record that was quite remarkable. Although he never served in the majority in his 23 years in the House, he became the Republican leader of the powerful Energy and Commerce Committee. That committee, if you don't know, uh, has a lot of jurisdiction. And one thing they had was a lot of work on the environment. When I first went to work for, for Senator Broyhill, Almost every Friday, he would say he had to go on an environmental study trip. And I thought, boy, he's conscientious working on Friday and going on an environmental study trip. It took me about a month to learn that he was going to play golf, and that was his <laughs> environmental study trip. Also, I do know that he learned uh, he, he loved golf. He only let me play golf with him one time. Those of you who've played with me would know why. We, it normally takes four hours to play around. Uh, we played in two and a half hours, and it was on that round that I met Richard Burr for the first time. Uh, we played through every group. Uh, everybody would see Broyhill coming, and they would say, come on through, come on through, and I could hardly keep up with it. But uh, it was on this committee that he gained a reputation for hard work uh, and the ability to work across the aisle. It was Senator Broyhill who led the fight to pass much of Ronald Reagan's agenda to deregulate a number of industries, such as the telecommunications industry, which allowed for the expansion of the cable TV industry. 
He was President Reagan's primary partner in the creation of the Federal Energy Department, as well as the elimination of many unnecessary uh, regulations. Uh, Senator Budd, there's still a few more you can work on. Uh, Senator Broyhill strongly believed in the importance of constituent service. You've heard that many times today. He often met with new members of Congress when they came to Washington, excuse me, new Republican members of Congress, uh, when they came to Washington to impress upon them the importance of constituent service. Thousands of his constituents live better lives because he and his staff secured Social Security disability and veterans benefits and passports. In fact, the staff used to tease him that he worked harder for Democrats who would never think of voting for him than he did for Republicans. Now, that was not true. Uh, but you know, you've heard that Senator Broyhill liked to tease. Well, we like to tease him also. He earned the title as father of the modern-day Republican Party in North Carolina. You may know he was gerrymandered several times in unsuccessful efforts to defeat him. Because he treated all citizens fairly and without regard to race, gender, socioeconomic status, or political affiliation, Senator Broyhill made it respectable to be a Republican in North Carolina. Dr. Michael Walden, NC State Professor Emeritus, recently told me that Senator Broyhill is on the Mount Rushmore of North Carolina's public servants. I would say he's at the very top. If Senator Broyhill were, had known to give me uh, hints about what to talk about, he would have made me tell two stories. Number one, he's a forgiving man. I worked against him in his first campaign. I worked against him. Our Republican chairman in my home county of Rowan ran against Roy Hill. And so I was loyal to the one that I knew and the one that I uh, lived in his county. He only lost by 10 to 1. So right, right after the uh, election, I called the Broy Hill headquarters and said teenagers would go to work uh, for Broy Hill, and we did. Second, you've t heard about what a perfectionist he is on the written word. I used to do a little bit of writing for him, and I wrote the questionnaire uh, to send out to our constituents. And I did the greeting, and I got it back from him, and he had written OK on it and hadn't changed a single word. And I was really proud because he was a tough grader. Uh, but then for some reason, I had to send it back in to him another time, and he, marked, he changed every word except dear friends and with warmest regards. And he never let, he never <laughs> let me forget that. The time doesn't permit me to list all his civic, religious, and philanthropic contributions. So permit me to simply say that Senator Broyhill was a, a leader in many organizations and education and transportation bonds across our state. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to <clears throat> read a poem which the Senator read at his sister Betty's funeral and his sister-in-law, Faye Arnold Broyhill's funeral. It's called, God Takes Only the Best. It's lonesome, I, I hope I can get through this. It's lonesome here without you. We miss you more each day. Life doesn't seem the same since you went away. When days are sad and lonely and everything goes wrong, we seem to hear you whisper, cheer up and carry on. Each time we see your picture, you seem to smile and say, don't cry for me. I'm in God's keeping. We'll meet again someday. God saw you were getting tired and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and said, come with me. With tearful eyes, we watched you suffer and saw you fade away. Although we love you dearly, we could not make you stay. A golden heart stopped beating, hard working hands at rest. God broke our hearts to prove he only takes the best. Amen. Senator Broyhill used to end his, many of his speeches with this comment. There are three ingredients for a successful campaign. Number one is hard work, number two is hard work, and number three is hard work. I can think of no better way to honor the memory of Senator James Thomas Broyhill than to work hard for the good of our state, our nation, and our world. Now it's my honor to introduce another Jim. By the way, you can spell that Jim, G-E-M, 
or JIM. Governor Jim Martin and the late Governor Jim Holsauser are also on North Carolina's Mount Rushmore of public servants. So we'll now hear from one of North Carolina's favorite public servants, former county commissioner, former member of the United States Congress, and former governor of our great state, the Honorable Jim Martin. to share this power-filled pulpit this morning. Somebody wrote my notes upside down. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> James Thomas Broyhill, family man, church man, man of the people, A proper epitaph begins with the most important commitments. And a devout Christian knows that family and family unity is the key to everything else. I'm thinking of what Laura described, family in 360 degrees. All that he learned from Mr. Ed Broyhill and Miss Sadie growing up alongside his brother and sisters was the foundation of his long and devoted marriage to our dear Louise. It was faithfully passed down to Marilyn, Philip, and Edgar, and through them to six grandchildren, and they've got their work cut out for them. And yes, to Phil Kirk, who served him as faithfully as any man could devote his life to another. And to each of you, in turn, what a tribute to have the extended family here today. Which brings us to his chosen vocation. It's truly written by Phil Kirk that Jim Broyhill was father of the Republican Party, which makes Mr. Ed our paternal grandfather. A national commitment tradition continued in Edgar. Jim not only made it respectable to be a Republican, he made it respectable to be a politician. I know now you're going to say, oh, wait, wait, whoa. He was a statesman. But you see, to get there, it helps to be successful in politics. So when I arrived in Washington in December 1972, he already had Phil in their office coaching mine, getting us ready. And then this 10-year veteran showed me that he could see through my confident, youthful facade that I could use a bit of humility. He showed me the ropes while Louise comforted Dottie. You see, it's a pretty strange place up there. Then after he and I survived the 1974 post-Watergate tsunami, I'll tell you, I was stunned when he wanted me to seek membership on what I knew only vaguely was referred to as the powerful Ways and Means Committee. What? What do they do? Taxes. I don't know anything about taxes. He just smiled. He said, you still know how to study, professor? It turned out that the Republican Committee on Committees had decided to make appointments that year in reverse alphabetical order, so my preference, the Appropriations Committee, would come next to last before agriculture, and his Ways and Means preference would come first. Now, guess who represented the entire Southeast on the Republican Committee on Committees. <laughs> right, Jim Broyhill. He told me, North Carolina needs someone on Ways and Means. Well, I guess I qualified, I was someone. He said, we had 
We'd not had a tax writer since Bob Doughton was chairman of Ways and Means in the 30s and 40s. And in 1935, he agreed to sponsor Roosevelt's new Social Security program. The price for that for FDR? Well, you see, there was this little Works Progress Administration project to build something called the Blue Ridge Parkway over there in Tennessee. Somehow, it turned out it got built over here in the old North State instead. For me, it led to a unique opportunity to work on President Reagan's 1981 tax cuts. Of course, its author, Jack Kemp, you see, it was not on the Ways and Means Committee. He was on appropriations. So I was among some of the Ways and Means folks who served as what he called his agents provocateurs. He never told me what that meant. In my last term, Jim helped me get elected to party leadership position, one of five, chairman of the Republican Research Committee. And it was just in time to head off a legislative unilateral freeze on strategic weapons. And this saved President Reagan a stronger hand for negotiating a treaty with the Soviet Union. You know, Jim was always encouraging. I remember when he invited me for a round of golf at Elk River, I believe it was, where one of the fairways runs alongside a runway for the airport. Is that the one? Well, okay, so I pushed my drive over onto the tarmac of that runway, and away it went. It bounced, and it bounced, and it bounced, and I was so embarrassed, but he would have none of that. He wanted me to take pride in my work. He said, wow, that drive must have gone 1,000 yards. After Jim Broyhill won the GOP primary, by the way, that before his time, that was called the great opportunities for postmaster. You know, if Eisenhower got elected, and you were the Republican, you got to be the postmaster. But after he won the primary for the United States Senate in 1986, John East's death meant it was my responsibility to appoint his successor for the four months remaining. Of course, my choice could only be the most widely respected, trusted, and admired congressman in the entire South. The most widely trusted, respected, and admired. It was the best choice for North Carolina, but maybe not for Jim's campaign. For one thing, the Senate refused to adjourn in time for us to have campaign events. And you know how Broyhill was conscientious, duty called first. So we fell short by a mere 1.8%. And that's how it came to be that I was the one who finally put Jim Broyhill in jeopardy. This also opened an opportunity for Phil Kurt to join my administration and also to recruit Jim Broyhill to the Economic Development Board, where he soon became chairman. And in January of 1989, he became Secretary of Commerce to oversee its 25 regulatory and promotional commissions and boards. And this put him in the driver's seat for America's most successful industrial recruiting program among all 50 states, along with guiding our trade relations with Europe and Asia. It also gave Secretary Broyhill the reins for his three new programs that he initiated, promotion of tourism and big-time sports events under the Travel Council, pioneering an aggressive export program for North Carolina industry, offering free training, worldwide advertising, and opening new trade offices in Toronto and Taipei to go along with the old ones in Tokyo and Dusseldorf. His third big innovation for North Carolina was an educational initiative for workforce preparedness. 
and he recruited Food Line's CEO, Tom Smith, as its first president. Now, instead of a bunch of new studies, they took four we already had on the shelf and in eight months had it up and rolling. It put special reliance on our community college system to get our young people ready to work. Smart. Now, in a moment, I will yield the balance of my time to Senator Burr, but I have to say this in closing. To be rather than to seem. Surely our state motto found its exemplary icon in this man, Jim Broyhill. He was my teacher and coach. He was my leader. He was my friend. Thank God that North Carolina and the Broyhill family could raise us such a man. Amen. Peace, peace. He is not dead. He does not sleep. He's just awakened from life's dream. Boy, did Jim Broyhill dream big for all he accomplished. I had the good fortunes a couple of weeks ago to be a Romeo in that short period, Bill and Jack, to have lunch with Jim and Jack and Bill and I were there to ask the obvious, Jim, how are you doing? At which time, Jim started his inquisition of all three of us. Wanted to know about my new job and wanted to know how his buds at 94 and 95, if they were still driving. Uh, it turned into a great lunch, didn't it, Penn? So many goals, so many accomplishments, so many lives impacted by James T. Broyhill. Jim Broyhill was the real deal. Phil alluded to constituent service. For all of us who've, who have served since Jim Broyhill, he set the bar so high that it's hard for us to meet. Phil may remember the story that Jim believed that Saturday was constituent service day and his constituents shouldn't have to drive to where he had an office. So he got a trailer, and he opened the side of the trailer and put the awning down, and Jim Broyhill proceeded to have constituent service every Saturday. Ted sounds like a pretty good idea, doesn't it? Um, he set the bar for so many of us. Jim Broyhill didn't focus on the popular issues. Jim was focused on issues that had a generational impact to him, as you've heard from most who have spoken today. His colleagues in the United States Senate saw Jim as genuine. They saw him as smart as a fox. He was tough on the issues that required him to be tough, and he was flexible on the issues that made this country great. Jim Broyhill was my counselor. He was my critic, he was my mentor, but more importantly, he was my friend. I remember calling Jim one day. In the 28 years, we've had some tough times lately. And I needed to call my counselor and get some advice. And before I could get out of my mouth, Governor, what I was struggling with, Jim said, God, I'm envious of you. And I said, envious? No, nobody in their right mind would be envious of what we're going through. He said, I was there 25 years. I never did, got to do things like impeachments. <laughs> you see, Jim really understood the rules and the Constitution. And to exercise something that was there to him, gosh, I'm sorry I missed it. But you know he didn't miss it. And today, Jim's not going to miss anything that goes on from this point forward. 
The day I was sworn into the United States House of Representatives, Jim was more excited than I was. And I remembered as he hung around the office and people got to where they were headed out, Jim saw me alone in the office and he walked in and he shut that door. And I thought, boy, he's, he's going to give me the inside story. He's going to te teach me, Ed, the secret handshake or whatever it is in Congress. And the senator looked at me and he said this, I've never met anybody that was defeated for something they didn't say. I've never met anybody that was defeated for something they didn't say. That was something that Jim Broyhill firmly believed, that you weren't an expert on everything, that you didn't have to comment on everything, but you weighed in with when what you had to say impacted people positively in this country. Jim Broyhill was never a show horse. He was merely a workhorse. Now I've got the pleasure of reading a eulogy that was provided by Secretary of State Jim Baker, Secretary of State of George H.W. Bush, Secretary of the Treasury for Ronald Reagan, Chief of Staff to Ronald Reagan and H.W. Bush. To Louise, Ed, Marilyn, and all the Broyhill family, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I cannot be with you today to celebrate the life and legacy of James Thomas Broyhill, a truly beautiful human being whose service is an enduring reminder of that which has made our nation such a great one. And perhaps more importantly, Jim serves as an example for a new generation less concerned about getting things done for the American people than they are about assigning blame for the problems confronting our country. I first came to know Jim when he was a congressman. We worked closely with President Gerald Ford, and I was the President's Undersecretary of Commerce. I soon came to admire both the work ethic of the congressman from North Carolina, as well as his ability to forge policy that both sides of the partisan aisle could support. No one on Capitol Hill outworked Jim Broyhill or focused more on getting results than he did. Make no mistake, Jim was a rock rib Republican and a true conservative who helped turn the state from blue to red. But he was much more interested in advancing policy than he was about scoring political points. As a result, he became a critical ally of the next president, Ronald Reagan, who believed, like Jim did, that we gauge our elected officials by what they get done. In many ways, the Gipper and Jim are two peas out of the same pod. Of course, no one was more conservative than President Reagan, but he understood the importance of bipartisanship so did Jim. As President Reagan's White House Chief of Staff, I witnessed firsthand Jim's critical role in helping the administration get legislation through a Democrat Congress controlled by House Speaker Tip O'Neill. When we faced an impasse, Jim rolled up his sleeves and he went to work. Like President Reagan, Jim understood that our national ideal of e pluris unum, out of many, one, is not simply a hollow slogan as too many Americans seem to feel today. The two of them saw it as a guiding principle for their brand of conservatism. Theirs was a message that is sorely needed today during our period of national anger, when politicians would rather yell at each other about who's to blame for our problems than talk with one another about how to solve them. Symbolic of our national anger is the partisan animosity between Republicans and Democrats that has brought Washington to a standstill. We can't seem to get anything done because our government isn't working for us. Jim practiced a critical trait required of our democracy. He carefully listened to friends and foes alike. He wouldn't discount an idea simply because it came from a Democrat. When he saw a policy he thought might work, he pursued it regardless of its origins. I cannot think of a more important trait for America today than one that defined Jim. And I fear for a nation that forgets the importance of working together like he did. We admired Jim Broyhill, and we will miss him, but we will see him on the other side. The Secretary knows, as most here who knew Jim Broyhill, 
We expect Jim to greet us at the gates of heaven when we arrive. Amen.
and members of the royal family, thank you for inviting me to briefly reflect uh, from a biblical point of view, pastoral point of view, about uh, your husband and our dear friend. And, and to uh, Dr. Kankin and Reverend Ford, I appreciate their allowing a former pastor here to throw off the mothballs and show back up for a minute. So thank you for your gracious hospitality. Would you pray with me, please? O oh, kind and caring God, be with us in these moments as you have been throughout this day. Help us and strengthen us as we remember your son Jim and all that he was and all that he meant and all that he stood for. Empower us by the faith we have in your son Jesus who says, whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Across the years since I've had the privilege of knowing Louise and the family and the senator, uh, he has constantly, when I was here, then when we went to New York for a number of years and got back, he has stayed in contact with me uh, primarily through emails that came with some frequency. Oftentimes they were jokes uh, and good ones and clean ones. Uh, Jim would send me jokes, I assume, uh, seeking to lift my spirit. Uh, perhaps he knew best of all that uh, one thing elected officials and pastors have in common is that almost never does anybody contact us to tell us how happy they are. So he would send me jokes, I guess, to pick the spirit up a little bit. But as the years passed, he increasingly sent me spiritual and religious articles, uh, wonderfully thoughtful explorations of faith from a variety of perspectives. And they were always titled, the title line of the email, This Will Preach. I assume he thought I needed all the help I could get at that having listened to me enough. And that didn't stop. As Ed said, we were, last time I was with the senator, we, we were together, and as you recall, he said, um, I had tried to pitch a bill to him about not dying. You know, I, th I think we got the majority here. We need people like you to stick around, but he wouldn't vote that way. He was ready for the next adventure. And he looked at me and said, preaching my funeral won't be hard. I've already done all your work for you. What you had, he was almost through with his memoir. So what I want to say, and I'll try to do this quickly, I promise. Um, on the other hand, I'm a minister, and I'm going to leave after this is over. So what are you going to do, fire me? But I promise I will do this as briefly as one can do it with such a great presence that we're here to remember. Uh, but what I want to do is let Jim do the work. Uh, I'm not going to say anything to you that you already know and have already said so beautifully. Everything I say for the next few moments will come directly from the memoirs that he wrote and from the Bible that he believed in so deeply. Real briefly, Jim talked in his memoirs about how much he cared for his constituents. You've heard that from the esteemed selection of speakers who have preceded me. Uh, and you, you heard uh, Phil Kirk, who was uh, his chief of staff, say that Jim worked as hard for Democrats as he did for Republicans, uh, which you said jokingly, but I know you were sincere because Jim looked upon all of his constituents as his responsibility. And it really didn't matter to him if you were red or blue, old or young, rich or poor, white, brown or black. If you were one of his constituents, he believed that your well-being was his responsibility because I think he took seriously what Jesus said. You shall love your neighbor, all of them, as you love yourself. Thank God Jim believed in that. He worked, and, and thank you, Senator Burr, for pointing this out. He worked collegially. Uh, he knew who he was. He knew who he represented. He knew what party he believed in, but he worked across both sides 
of the aisle. I remember his saying to me once, we sat up in, in your study now, he said, I never believed in making an enemy of someone who had a different point of view from mine. I always thought if we just listen to each other, I can learn something from them. And with any luck, they'll learn something from me. What a beautiful philosophy of life, uh, based, I think, again, upon his faith that says, be ye kind one to another, and by so doing, we build the kingdom that none of us can build alone. And when you come to his personal life, oh my goodness, you folks knew him. When you come to his personal life, whether it was political or anything else, Jim Broyhill was a man of honor and principle, character and dignity. He was a man who, when he said something, you didn't have to wonder whether or not he was telling the truth. Again, I think, because he believed in Jesus who said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, and don't make anyone doubt which one it is. He was a man. You know what I think set him apart? And this is just me, but I think what set him apart and made him as noble as he was is that some, a handful, of elected officials see themselves as political leaders. Jim Broyhill saw himself as a public servant. What a profound difference. Where did he get that idea? Maybe from Jesus, who said the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve. One of the things I admired about him so deeply was that he saw himself as an advocate for people. He knew everybody, presidents and kings and captains of industry and education and those who helped to build and to protect the system of capitalism, which he honored. Uh, he knew people that the rest of us read about in history books or see on the evening news. But what I found so exemplary was that when you got to know him, he spoke with equal passion about anonymous folks, about some family that lived at the end of a dirt road up in, in Caldwell or Watauga County. And not only were they at the end of the road, they were at the end of their rope. Their hope had run out. And they felt that this, this family farm that had been theirs for generations was going to be lost. And then Jim would begin to work his magic on behalf of somebody who could never, ever, ever begin to repay him. But his repayment was the joy he found in helping someone move from darkness to light, from despair to hope. What a magnificent spirit he was. Uh, he did that for everybody, you know. Uh, young people, old people, students, the poor, the privileged soldiers, uh, people of age. He was there for those who needed him. He, did, he advocated for the workers at Broyhill. In his memoirs, everything I'm saying basically is coming from his memoirs. Thank you, Jim, for doing my job for me. Uh, but he, he talked about how he worked hard with the Human Resources Division at Broyhill and really ramped it up and made it into something that never would have been without him in, in all likelihood. And, and he used to tell the supervisors there, there will be times when you're going to have to be tough, but I always, always expect you to be fair with these workers. And they were loyal because they were treated fairly. He took care of his people. He, he loved the high country, which people who live there call God's country, and understandably so. Uh, he loved Caldwell County and, and Watauga and Allegheny and all that beautiful western part of the state. Kind of go to Boomer to be interred. Uh, just love the area. And I have the privilege of, of spending about four months a year up there. And I, I said to him, Jim, you know, uh, 
you can't drive two miles without seeing your name. You just, it's everywhere. I mean, and roads named for you and community centers and buildings at App State and Caldwell Community College and, and places here and things there and public parks where people can drink in the, the beauty of that pristine area. He was an environmentalist, heart and soul. You know, just, just everywhere I look, Jim, your legacy, your name is, you know, there, there are people, I, I don't know any, uh, but there are people who could get really puffed up about that. People who would, you know, just say, well, aren't I the benevolence? You know what, what he said to me when I told him? I said, you, you, you can't drive two miles without seeing your name on something. He said, well, as long as you don't see my picture in the post office. <laughs> Humor, humility, honor. I lift up my eyes into the hills. Let me, let me mention two things. I'm going to be seated and you can say, thank you, Jesus. Um, he was committed to the country, patriotism, the state, the people. You know that. You've heard that. He was committed to his family. You know that. You've heard that. Uh, in his memoirs, he refers to you as his gorgeous bride. His gorgeous bride. Uh, whenever he would say anything to me about you, Louise, he would always, always say, you know, I married above myself. And uh, first time he ever said that, I didn't know how to respond. Afterwards, I said, yeah, you did. <laughs> he understood um, what an elegant first lady you were for him. And uh, how you added to the campaigns, but how the, the depth of what it meant for you to be his strength and security and mom and homemaker and uh, partner. Again, Jesus said, for this cause shall a man leave his parents and join to his wife, the two shall become one. What a great illustration of that. Now he loved you uh, when he would mention to any of us stories about his children, grandchildren, uh, often they would start with that, the, the kind of dry grin. But by the end of the story, his face would be beaming pride. He loved you, and you knew that. And on occasions like this, in our years in the ministry, we've all been with too many families who didn't know that. What a tragic moment that is. You don't ever have to doubt it. You were loved. He was a man of faith. And I think that's why he was so at peace with this ultimate end. Uh, he looked upon life as a journey and, and the destination was beyond that which I can see believed in what you heard read earlier, the promise of Jesus in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have said that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare that place, I will return again and receive you unto myself. Wherever I am, there you may be also. He faced death with a sense of courage, without an ounce of fear because he knew that death was not the end of things, just the doorway to life that has no end. In his memoirs, Jim wrote, always allow love to rule your life. If I've said nothing else you remember today, remember that. That quote from this man, always allow love to rule your life. He understood that is the greatest virtue 
And without that, nothing else makes sense. Again, because he knew Jesus, who said, only time he ever used the word command as an imperative verb, only time, this I command you, that you love people. He wasn't nervous about dying because he knew it was simply movement to a place where hand in hand he would be on his next adventure, alongside the one who taught him how important love is. Jim Broyhill, North Carolinian public servant, advocate for the people, defender of democracy, loving husband, loving father and grandfather, devoted friend, man of honor, follower of Christ. Tom Campbell, the esteemed journalist from our state, wrote this past week, we'll probably not see the likes of Jim again. The best and most lasting tribute we could pay him would be to learn from him to live as he lived and to serve as he served. May it be so. Let us pray. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, James Thomas Broyhill. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive Jim into your arms of mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and in the glorious company of saints of life. O God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us with even to this day, for the gift of joy in days of health and strength and for gifts of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and for friends, for our baptism and place in your holy church, and with all who have faithfully lived and died. And above all else, we thank you for Jesus who knew our griefs, who died our death and rose for our sake and who lives and prays for us even at this time. In his most precious name we pray, amen. And may we pray his prayer as we hear it sung.
temptation but deliver us from Let us stand and sing together in unison hymn number 428 for the healing of the nations. Receive this blessing, this benediction. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among and remain with you always, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>